The central kind of myth that I want to bust really is people are under the impression that they can get something for free, which they can't. That winds me up, like not taking account or not just not thinking, where did this material come from? What has been removed from it? People need to realize that energy in is energy out and you can't get something for nothing, basically. Then the whole myth, crashing down. Who but needs to be chartered, eh? <laughs> Well, Barnaby, I wanted to now go to the demolition zone. Oh, hell yeah. Yeah, yeah. Jewel towers for a reason. Two, what, two points. Yeah, what does really. it represent? Yeah. Well, so the, the, the central kind of myth that I want to bust really is, is the idea that you can get something for nothing, which you would hope most people understand is, is a fallacy. But I see it a lot in, in the startup world, in the world of construction, people are under the impression that they can get something for free, which, which they can't. And I've got two things here because one represents your chemicals in equals your chemicals out. That's like an immutable law, you know? And the second one is energy in is energy out. Because again, you, you can't create or destroy energy. I think one of those scientists in the past had some law about it, you know? But despite that, <laughs> despite that being a very old idea, people still seem to have not grasped it in my book. So. I think I, I've had, I don't know, I don't know, I think we'll start with, we'll start with the chemicals in equals chemicals out, right? Because I have seen, again, I don't want to name and shame ideas or startups or anything, but this idea that you can make, say, a low carbon aggregate by taking CKD, which is cement kiln dust, and reacting that with CO2 to, to partially carbonate it and turn it into a more stable material that, that, that can then go into cement, for example. You go, okay, great. And you look at the numbers for how much energy it takes for them to do this carbonation, sort of per tonne of CO2 captured, and it's really low. And people go, wow, that's, that's great. It's like, yeah, but that cement kiln dust that they are carbonating came from limestone. It was calcium carbonate to begin with. So recarbonating it, at best, you're gonna get to where you started. And that Cement kiln dust can be used for other things. It could go back into the kiln. It could be used as a cementitious binder. There are options, right? So just going back to where you started, and that's in a best case scenario. I saw a paper from 2024, which is this year, if I'm not mistaken, saying they looked at this. They looked at carbonating CKD and some blast furnace slags, and they managed to get 50 grams of CO2 stored inside one kilo or every kilo of this cement kiln dust. And you think, well, great, you know, if that, you know, that'll add up if you've got a lot of it. But then you look at how much CO2 was produced from that cement kiln dust in the first place, and it's 400 grams or something. It's like half a kilo per kilo. So in 2024, recarbonation, and they're hitting 14% recarbonation or something like that. So really, it's a poor use of a material just to go from where you were back to where you were and just using energy in the process. It's mind boggling to me that that's something that people <coughs> go, great idea that. No, it's not. <laughs> no, no, it isn't really. <laughs> it's, it just isn't. And, and, so, and you see that with things all the time. And people that use alkali activated materials, they think, well, you know, this sodium hydroxide didn't come from limestone, so it doesn't have any CO2. It's like, well, yeah, but have you seen how they make sodium hydroxide? They use lime in the production and that lime will have come from limestone. So somewhere down the line, your chemicals in are your chemicals out. And people draw these whack system boundaries where they just say, no, 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 this is our process. What goes on outside of our process, it's not my business. It's like, yeah, it is. Yeah, it is. So that, that winds me up, like not taking account or not, not just not thinking, where did this material come from? What has been removed from it? What, you know, all of these things need to be taken into account, I think. And it goes hand in hand with my other tower, which is energy in equals energy out. And this is, this is so critical because people don't, I, I think people don't appreciate I don't know what you would actually call that, but I, I call it like internal energy. So some materials have got a high internal energy. A lot of energy went into them to make them. And they're not hot or anything when you touch them. It's not that kind of energy. But cement is a really good example of this. When we make it, we pump a load of energy in, trap it in a high energy state. And then when we add water and make buildings with it, it releases all of this energy. And that's what, that's, that is the cement setting. It's using its stored energy. And it comes out, cement gets hot when you use it. You won't know that unless you pour big slabs of cement and stuff, but some people have to add ice to the cement and the concrete when they're making it in a hot country because the heat can be deleterious and whatever. But the cement is a really high energy material. 
And then you look at slag and people go, well, it's not cement, so it's better. But you go, well, okay, but why is it working? Why is it such a good cement replacement? And it's because slag also has a really high internal energy. It's got all of this energy that went into making it. And these, these materials with high internal energies, just because they don't look like they've got a bunch of carbon associated with them, I think it would be healthier for people to think that energy has come from somewhere. Where has that energy come from? It, it, it's, it's, a, it's a difficult way to look at the materials because they don't, they're not radiating the energy in any way. But it went in at some point. Again, maybe not in your system boundary, but it did go in. Mm. And if you're using that energy, again, it's like... It's like people that carbonate slags and say, well, we can sequester a ton of CO2 for, you know, half a megawatt hour per ton or something like that. I had a conversation with an investor and they go, your energy per ton of CO2 to, to sequester is quite high. You know, I've seen like, like 0.3 or something. Like that. And I go, let me guess. They were carbonating a fly ash or something. And they go, yeah, how did you know? You go, well, because the only way you would get the energy that low is if you've got some big unaccounted energy stored in the material that you're carbonating and that's what you're you're leveraging to bring down this other number so your you know your showcase number is great but this number that you're not showing is what's making it so low and people need to realize that energy in is energy out and you can't you can't get something for nothing basically that's that's what it is and it's so easy to miss and if you if you just notice it you go god there's there's so much energy here there's so much energy there you got to do this you got to do that and it's not a bad thing like having that mentality is why is why we we do what we do. You know, magnesium silicates. The 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 earth does produce high energy materials. You know, the, you know, the, in the core there's a lot of energy a lot of floating around, whatever. Magnesium silicates are not the lowest energy they can be. They want. My old chemistry professor used to say that chemicals want things, but it's it's a bad way of thinking. I think you shouldn't <laughs> you shouldn't personalize these things. But it, it wants to be in a lower energy state, and a lower energy state is magnesium carbonate. So if you carbonate it, it wants to be carbonated. And you can take that, the energy difference between where you are to where you're going, and you can take that energy and put it into the supplementary cementitious material that we make, which means that really you've got a sort of a energy down and an energy up, cancel out. Your actual energy input can be really low, and you can sort of leverage that energy in a, in a better way that isn't, isn't hidden somewhere, you know? So it's not, it's not a problem but it's definitely something people should think about and i definitely think it makes for better life cycle analyses and better holistic processes and all of these things so i think that's my that's my myth you can't get something for nothing even though sometimes it looks like you can i love that that's great and i think that when people understand and realize that then there's going to be more accurate reporting on yeah like 100 percent. and there's and like i say it, it was just like with when we were talking about batteries and stuff it's industry that i don't i don't know anything about but if you've got scrap metal for example that scrap metal has had a ton of energy put into it that is it is ringing with energy that, that can come out in various different ways mm. leaving it on a scrap heap to rust the reason it rusts is because it's high energy going to a lower energy so you're just letting it seep its energy out into the environment wasting it turning it into rust no, utilize that internal energy. It's in there. You just have to realize it's in there and go, okay, yeah, fine. So that that is not a waste material. That is a secondary material. That is an energy source, mm -hmm. you know, mm -hmm. not not waste. So and it'll be it'll be like that in loads of sectors, honestly. Good. Love that. Well, I feel like you have debunked this myth. All is that's left to do now is for you to destroy destroy so the tower. my civil engineering skills being put to the test, right? <laughs> the central tenant needs to come out. If people stop realizing that you can't get something for nothing, represented by him right here, then the whole myth <laughs> crashing down. Beautiful. The pro. So Who needs to be chartered, eh? <laughs> <laughs> hey, this. <laughs> <laughs> that's great we're moving one block uh, yeah those two towers just fall down awesome great <laughs> well one of the things i'm i'm kind of minded of now from this conversation is your view on the existing building stock that we've got not mm. just in the uk but across the world that's just left yeah or that needs to be refurbished yep what are your what are your thoughts on the energy that's contained in those buildings to use that analogy that you've used with the with the with the rusting steel, yeah, and that energy kind of just seeping out. What are your thoughts on on that? So I mean, yeah, it's a it's a really good tangent, I suppose. I mean, firstly, current building stock being repurposed is so much better than being torn down and then having to come up with a way of utilizing the waste concrete, which you know people again have great ideas for how to reutilize waste concrete, 
but it'd be a hell of a lot better just to leave the building up and find something to do with it. It's easier to refurbish and, you know, you don't have to have a shiny new building all the time. A hundred percent. You're better off utilizing. So yeah, to, to bring the energy into it, you've used all of this energy. You've put all of this energy into the cement. You've, all of that energy has come out as the building has set. You've used that energy now. To then, de- to then destroy that building, all of that energy that you put in is wasted. Mm-hmm. You know, you, you, you leave it there. You, you have to keep using it. And it's like we said, it, it's, it's, it's not an element of modular design, say, but it is having a mindfulness about when you're designing a building, don't just design it for the one thing that it's being used for right now. You know, that building's going to be there for 150 years. It's not always going to be a library. It's not always going to be a bank. I don't know. I literally couldn't think of a different type of building. <laughs> but it's going to be—it's going to be used for all sorts of different things. This wasn't always a podcast studio. You know, I'm sure it was something else. Yeah, something to do a, with leather. A leather. Mill. <laughs> yeah, it was a leather mill. Yeah. You know, and and that's great. That's absolutely brilliant. And if we are mindful of how we build buildings and think about probable loads and all of that stuff. And I don't think, I I don't want people to use it as an argument to say, well, we'll just make the building as strong as possible so it can be used as a garage or something and have vans and cars parked in there. No, because then people will just use a boatload more concrete. But having a mindfulness and and an awareness of building a building in a way that means it can be used for a variety of different things is obviously going to prolong mm. its its life mm. and, and how it can be useful. It's mm-hmm. a really good thought. Why don't we, I was wondering if you can just break down how cement is actually made. Yeah, so cement has two main ingredients and a third smaller one that's added right at the end. But the main two are limestone so essentially chalk stuff you write on blackboards with which has the chemical composition of calcium carbon and three oxygens and the other one is clay so not modeling clay but you know essentially just very very fine aluminosilicates and the clay is made up of silicon dioxide so silicon and an oxygen two oxygens and aluminium oxide so aluminium and a couple of oxygens they all get put in a furnace so you've got your clay and your limestone this is where the emissions one of the emissions of sources arises in the cement and the the limestone breaks down so that calcium carbonate turns into calcium oxide and you're left with the carbon and the two oxygens which go off as co2 you're left with calcium oxide which then as you get progressively hotter and hotter and hotter starts to react with the clay and turns into the phases that react with water in cement so a light b light and these are vaguely complicated and difficult to remember calcium aluminium silicon mixes and there are minor phases as well iron ones and all sorts of stuff that is the realm of the cement chemist which is quite a ethereal job i find it doesn't uh, it's not the most easily understood thing but the the cement is heated and heated and heated until you get to about 1450 degrees and it's sort of a semi-molten state and then it falls out of the end of the furnace basically and is cooled really rapidly sort of to to freeze the cement in in these reactive phases so when you talk about rapid cooling do you mean it goes into a freezer or a chiller no i think they just use big fans okay they obviously can't water cool it because then the cement yeah, would start gonna, reacting yeah, and setting right. yeah. so yeah it falls out the end of the furnace and is and is and is air cooled and then it's into ground with calcium sulfate which stops the cement from flash setting when you add water because you need a couple of hours to do what you want with it, basically. Right. And the reason that it does that is complex <laughs> and, and myriad, I suppose. <laughs> Good. And so when you may go onto a building site and you've got a bag of cement and you've got a cement mixer and you see someone adding sand into that cement, yep. what's the purpose of that? So that's the, that's the transition from cement to concrete via mortar, I suppose, if you want to include that. Cement is really just the glue in concrete and it makes up not very much of the mass of the concrete amazingly this is part of the thing that makes cement so good you take your cement you add sand if you want to make mortar so that's just sand and cement and you add the water to it used to stick bricks together and then if you're making your traditional concrete you also add gravel basically as, larger, as well as the as sand. well as your sand yeah, yeah so you could just use cement on its own and it would make a, a paste cube, but you would need so much more of it. The gravel is just an inert filler. It just sits there. It's very strong, obviously. It's made of rock. So you're just gluing these bits of sand and, and gravel together, basically, and using their strength in in a homogenous matrix that you could then have control over the shape and the flow and all of these things. Good. Okay, and so the the the, the product that you've come up with, where is the where is the zero 
carbon element of that of that of that component of making the cement yeah or of making the concrete where does the net where does the zero part come for you yeah so we don't touch at Ceratec the water the sand or the gravel that yep. is the realm of the concrete maker yep. we are only tackling the cement because that's where 99 percent of your concrete emissions come from yep so the water sand and gravel they're fine yep other issues with sand but for us it's the cement is the issue so what we do is we have a, a process that essentially tacks onto a cement kiln that takes the CO2 that comes off from the limestone breaking down and from the fuel. And we suck that CO2 out of the big chimney that normally would go into the atmosphere. And we react that with magnesium silicates, another type of rock, basically. So it's just a third rock going into the cement kiln. And you break that down into a silica component of the magnesium silicate and and a magnesium component. And the silicate bit is a perfectly viable supplementary cementitious material. So it works just like blast furnace slag or fly ash. Blend it with your cement, 70-30 cement. Well, ours is called Ultramafix, but SEM. And you can just use that cement as it was. It's still got 70% cement in it. So the durability is really good. It's essentially a SEM 2B if you want to use the complicated cement classification but it's a it's a it's a reliable cement mix and the magnesium component is reactive and ready to combine with the co2 to turn into magnesium carbonate so we so the word is mineralize the co2 we turn it from a gas back into a mineral super stable super durable also works as a binder so we can use it to turn into bricks or boards and you can you can then sell these products back into the construction industry so we have still got cement We've got an SCM and we've got a magnesium carbonate binder called board where all of the CO2 that was produced making the cement that you're still using captured, mineralized, stable, not going anywhere for hundreds of thousands of years. Love it. Barnaby, it's been great having you on the podcast. Really enjoyed your energy, your enthusiasm and your passion for It's been a science. pleasure. Absolutely loved it. Have you got a piece of advice that you can give for somebody just finishing their A-levels that has got a passion for the sciences in whichever, whichever science it is, mm. but they can't really understand or see how they can apply those sciences in their life so that they feel fulfilled, successful, and contribute into the world. I would say, if I could go back knowing what I know now, don't just look at what universities are doing. I mean, it's great to find a research group that you're interested in, but if you're generally interested in Take biology, something I know literally nothing about. If, if, my, if I had a kid that was really into it, I would say, okay, go and look at some companies that are working on the absolute forefront, the knife edge of molecular biology in that bit that you find interesting and find out what it is they're doing. Shoot off some emails, do a little bit of research, actually focus on something that is going to happen in industry and then go forward and look at what academic places are available doing that research Maybe there will even be one that's co-funded by industry, the industry that you're interested in. That will definitely give you a leg up in finding something that is applicable and you can see it will be having a real world effect. I think that that's a really good way of doing that. Mm -hmm. And it applies to everything. You can, you, can, you can find anything and then go and look at industry and go, how is this being implemented? What are they actually doing? What is the industrial research? Where is industry heading? Mm -hmm. You know, don't, if you're interested in batteries, don't just go and look at what is going on in the world of battery research in academia. Go and find some battery companies. Go and see what they're doing. Go and see, go and see what the next big move is and then you know, have a conversation with them and then decide what your research could be. I think that would be a good one.